We're now going to start Chapter 8, which is entitled Valuing Concern for Nature. M many natural amenities don't have any market price. So these are not marketed goods. But that's simply th that certainly doesn't mean that they're not valuable. And so the question we're going to address in, in different ways throughout this entire chapter is how do we think about the economic value of non-marketed environmental assets? Now, these considerations also come into play if the environmental asset has a market. For example, a, uh, a state park that you have to pay an admissions fee in order to get in. The value of such an amenity may not be fully captured by the price. Um, so it has some marketed aspects and some non-marketed aspects. But the most important point is that even if there's no price charged on the asset or something like clean air, there's no way to charge a price for clean air, these environmental assets still have economic value. Uh, clean air has a tremendous amount of economic value, just to give one example. And so we want to think we want to ask how we think about these things that have economic value even if they're not bought and sold in the marketplace. And <clears throat> I might hear the word imputation because we can't observe the value in the marketplace. We have to impute the value. That is, we have to figure out other ways of determining what, what the value is. So in this first video, I just want to speak uh, speak in, in rather general terms about what kinds of values environmental amenities might have. Later on in this chapter we'll talk about how to measure these things numerically. So the, the first thing here is box 8.1, demand for recreational visits to a forest. And the idea is you can have the, let's say, number of visits on the horizontal axis and maybe I'll say admission fee on the vertical axis. If the government or the owner of the forest charged a really high admissions fee, presumably there would not be many visits. If the admission fee got lower, presumably there would be more visits. Even lower, even more, even lower, even more. And then you can think, well, how many visits are there going to be if the price is zero? to maybe here. And so one can sketch what is essentially a demand curve for visits to this 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 park. Let's look at the case where the price is zero. If you were just measuring value by how much people paid for it, well, of course, if it's a zero price, uh, people don't don't pay for it. But the entire area here under the demand curve and above the price line, which is zero, this whole thing is consumer surplus. W given that the the price is is zero as I said with this uh, with this red arrow. Now we we said the consumer surplus is not actually exactly equal to the value, and we'll talk more about that uh, in later on in this chapter. But it gives you some kind of idea that people would be willing to pay for visits to this park, even if they don't have to pay for visits to this park. So let's think more now about 
total economic value, which is in box 8.2. There are two main divisions, use value and non-use value. And I think the easiest way to understand this is by going through examples. The three kinds of use value, the first is indirect use value. And I've written here another word, consumptive, because <coughs> direct use value means that the natural resource is being consumed. For example, if you're talking about a forest, direct use value would be cutting down the trees and turning them into paper or turning them into lumber. That's the most obvious kind of economic value that a forest has. Another one is indirect use value. Indirect use value is non-consumptive, so you're not using the forest up. For example, uh, camping or hiking. To the extent that you're not damaging the forest when you do those things, it's providing indirect use value because that's non-consumptive use. Finally, and a bit more abstract, I guess, is, is the kind of use value that we call option value. So you might want to, let's say, preserve a state park, not because you want to go there tomorrow, but because you'd like to go there sometime in the future. Maybe a definite time or maybe an indefinite time. You just, in integrated language, you say we want to have the option of doing that. So people would be willing to pay to keep a state park in existence even if they uh, don't have any direct or indirect use value right now because they might have direct or indirect use value for it later. So these three, these are the three components of use value, direct use value, indirect use value, and option value. And now let's talk about non-use value. The first one is bequest value. So even if you don't care about a resource, you might want the resource to be preserved because you want your kids to be able to enjoy the resource, or your grandkids, or generic individuals living 200 years in the future. So it doesn't necessarily have to be literal bequests, that is, to, to somebody that you pass property to in your will. Uh, we're, not, we're not being that literal about things. I, I, indeed, <coughs> I write here, this, this idea includes gifts. So w giving things to other people when you're alive is, this, is, is a non-use value. And, and it's very similar to bequest value because you could want the thing to be preserved so that you can give it to somebody else even if you yourself might not care for it. So these values are additive. You can have bequest value whether or not you had some kind of use value. It, these are independent. And lastly, I write here existence value. So existence value is the value you put on the existence of something, even if you're not, if you don't have any direct use value for it, you don't have any indirect use value for it, you don't have any option value for it, and you don't have any bequest value for it. In other words, even if you didn't have any of those other kinds of values, you still might enjoy knowing that this natural amenity exists. For example, <coughs> that there are whales in the ocean, that whales exist, or that elephants exist in the wild in Africa. In, in general, any one particular person could have one or more of this list of values. So as I said when we were talking about uh, use values, these are independent. Um, uh, one person might have just one, one person might have two, or three, or four, or all five. Obviously, it's going to be difficult to figure out how to measure these, and that's what the rest of the chapter is going to be about, how to measure these values. And, and, uh, and economists have been thinking about this for, 
for more than 50 years and they have some ideas they're not um, perfect but they uh, they do I think as we'll see they, they do give us some notion of what these economic values are for non-marketed goods I wanted to mention one final thing in this video um, primary value which is measured on 113 the value of one thing depends on the amount of other things that are present. Let me just give you two examples. Um, the first example is that the value of moose in Yellowstone National Park depends on whether or not there are wolves. So for a large part of the 20th century there were no wolves in Yellowstone National Park. They had been exterminated by people. In that situation moose were quite destructive um, around especially viper riparian areas. So riparian areas are areas around bodies of water, uh, lakes and streams. Um, and the moose really like to eat the young plants that grow near lakes and streams. Now if there are wolves around, and wolves were reintroduced into Yellowstone in the late 20th century, I believe around the 1980s, so if the wolves around, if there are wolves around, moose don't spend a lot of time in riparian areas because riparian areas tend to be places where there are no large trees and no large shrubs. So a predator like a wolf pack can easily see if a moose is in a riparian area. Moose know this and so they spend short amounts of time in riparian areas because they don't want to be attacked by wolves. But during the large part of the 20th century when there were no wolves in Yellowstone, moose didn't have any problem just staying in riparian areas for many hours. They would do that. They really enjoyed eating all those plants. So what happened is the, the value of the moose was in some sense even perhaps negative because they really destroyed the, the young plants that didn't enable any young plants to grow. And so you got problems with erosion and basically very little vegetation around riparian areas compared to a more natural setting. So without wolves the value of moose in Yellowstone was low or I mean, maybe even maybe even negative. Once the wolves were reintroduced moose stopped hanging around in riparian areas uh, because it's, it was too dangerous for them. They went to riparian areas for short amounts short amount of time but, but that's all. So after the reintroduction of wolves, the value of moose in Yellowstone lost its negative characteristics. Another example, um, in, the, in the Henry Mountains of Utah, the value of bison depends on rabbits. So the big controversy there is, or, is, or maybe I should say was, bison versus cattle. The ranchers who run cattle in the Henry Mountains didn't want the state of Utah to reintroduce bison, and certainly not many bison, because they worried that the bison would compete with cattle for forage, for food. Because after all, bison and cattle look a lot alike, they are a lot alike in, in, in basic biological characteristics and in the kind of stuff that they eat and in roughly how large they are. So it certainly makes intuitive sense that if the state in, uh, introduced more bison, the cattle would have a hard time getting as much food as they did before and therefore ranchers would have a more difficult time with, uh, with raising cattle. But some research done at Utah State University actually showed that the real competing species for uh, cattle in the Henry Mountains is actually not bison. The, the real competing species is rabbits. Rabbits eat a large amount of the same kind of plants that cattle will eat. What these researchers did is they they went to the Henry Mountains and uh, enclosed in rabbit-proof fences some of the grazing areas and they showed that if you don't have rabbits 
you have really a lot denser vegetation than if you do. So, so it, tur so it turns out it's actually not the bison. It's the state reintroduced bison into the Henry Mountains, and I actually I'm not sure whether it's a reintroduction or a new introduction. I don't know whether. Uh, whether the bison are native to the Henry Mountains. But in any case, if the state put bison in the Henry Mountains, what we now understand, based on this research out of Utah State University, is that that really wouldn't hurt the ability of cattle to find food. Another I interaction that this, that this uh, illuminated <laughs> is coyotes. Coyotes can uh, kill calves and so ranchers often think of coyotes as being the enemy and in Utah, whoops, sorry about that, that's my dog. Um, let me, I'll just pause for a minute. All right, sorry about that interruption. Uh, so as I was saying, if it's actually rabbits that are the uh, that are the biggest competitor to cattle, um, then actually even though even though it's possible, but rarely happens that um, coyotes could kill calves, what what is much more common is that they would kill rabbits, and so actually. Th uh, ranchers might want to increase rather than decrease the number of coyotes on the rangeland. So that's another perhaps counterintuitive or surprising result from from this research. So these are all examples of situations where the value of one thing here, one uh, species, depends on the amount of other things present.